All of us have heard the expression, Renaissance man. This expression or phrase is often used to describe the likes of Thomas Jefferson, Rabindranath Tagore, Goethe, among some others, people who wrote voluminously or were people who, if they didn't write, were voluminous producers of art and contributed in a great many other spheres of life. Look at Rabindranath Tagore, right? Writes 2000 songs, which are sung in India and Bangladesh. Founds a university, much as Jefferson did. Rabindranath also, of course, is a novelist, writes volumes of short stories, hundreds of essays, is a public presence in the life of India in untold number of ways. The book I want to discuss today is about one such person who in my view is quite possibly the greatest American who ever lived. And quite possibly also one of the most forgotten people in the United States today. So I'm referring to Paul Robeson. And this is the book, Paul Robeson, A Washed Man. The subtitle is important, A Washed Man by Jordan Goodman, published by Verso a few years ago. Now Paul Robeson, <clears throat> and a little footnote on the pronunciation of his name, he was once asked, how should your name be pronounced? And he said, well, it's made up of two words, really. The first half, robe, is pronounced exactly the way that you pronounce the garment that one often wears after waking up in the morning or when one is lounging around, a robe. And son, he said, signifies the male child of a family. And so the pronunciation of my name, he says, is Robeson. So Paul Robeson is an African-American who's actually born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1878. This book is not truly a biography. It does give you an overview of his life. But the bulk of the book is really focused on the extraordinary travails of Paul Robeson. The scrutiny under which he was placed by the United States, the travails of his life, and the enormous dignity with which he confronted every adversity. And Paul Robeson was a giant of a figure. I don't mean this only in the literal sense. He was physically a towering figure, much in the, in the way in which when one speaks of Bacha Khan, he says a towering figure. Well, Bacha Khan or Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan was something like six feet, nine inches. But he was, of course, a magnificent man in every sense of the term, right? A non-violent warrior without peer. And Paul Robeson was a magnificent person, a, magnificent man, a man of magnificent stature. He was something like six feet, seven inches, something you know, in that range. But he is, as I said, to begin with that cliched expression, a Renaissance man. He was recognized by, the early, by his early 20s as being the greatest athlete in the United States, but because he was a black American, he never received his dues, never received the recognition that he should have. A star football player, a star 
track and field athlete. But Paul Robeson is also a person who is then going to establish, he goes on to earn a law degrees and then goes on to establish an absolutely spectacular career as an actor, singer. When he played Othello, the play had the longest run ever recorded of a play in Broadway for decades. And in London, Right? And he sings in as many as 25, 30 languages. He was a polyglot. He was completely fluent in at least half a dozen languages. But he sang in 25, 30 languages and is viewed as one of the greatest singers. And when he spoke, it was sheer oratory. Right? But he was also a major civil rights advocate Although when you read conventional histories of the civil rights movement, which I know very well, his name doesn't really figure in most of these histories. It doesn't figure in many of these histories, partly because one could argue that certainly by the 1960s, for reasons that we will soon understand, he had gone into obscurity, almost obscurity. He had really retreated into a private life. He was not well. And of course, he'd had enormous difficulties with the state, which he was now overcoming, but they had taken an enormous toll of him. But he was also not recognized because he was a staunch supporter of communism. And one thing that must be said about the civil rights movement is that the advocates of the civil rights movement, however great they were, and they were, right? The, the whole cast of absolutely stellar figures that one finds most prominently, of course, Martin Luther King, but Bayard Rustin, James Farmer, James Lawson, so many more that all of them, barring one or two exceptions, Jim Lawson being one of them, that the people in the civil rights movement were not sympathetic to communism at all. And so, of course, it was his fate, Paul Robeson's fate, that he was going to be disavowed by much of the black leadership as well. But I'm running ahead of myself because I want to say something a little bit about Paul Robeson's early life. And then, as I said, the book is not really you know, a full-fledged biography. It really focuses on, on his troubles with the United States government and his being blacklisted. Um, and I'm also going to focus really on that in this 20 odd minutes that, um, in the next 20 odd minutes that with, uh, in which I hope to finish my discussion uh, of this book. So he's born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1898. His, his father was a runaway slave from North Carolina. The town was actually one fifth black, Princeton, New Jersey, but the student body of Princeton was almost exclusively white. The students who attended Princeton actually came from largely below the Mason Dixon line. And for those of you who are not familiar with this expression, if you haven't grown up learning something about American history, reading about it in, in and, re, and you know, in later years, the Mason-Dixon line is the is the boundary uh, between uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, it marked the northern limit of what were the slave-owning states. So when we say that the students from um, uh, students at Princeton came from below the Mason-Dixon line, what I'm simply saying is they came from the deep south, right? They came from the deep south. Um, and it was sometimes said that Princeton University was like a big white plantation in the South. They were, they were blacks there, but they were not students. And they were certainly not on the faculty, but they were there to serve the white students. And no one should be fooled into thinking that because 
You don't have Jim Crow laws as such in the North that the North was devoid of racism. That was far from, of course, being the case. There was a racial hierarchy which was in many ways just as strict in the North as it was in the South without for the most part, for the most part, because there was violence in the North as well, but still for the most part, it was without the kind of brutal daily violence to which black people were subjected in the South. So Paul Robeson goes to Rutgers University where, which had a student body of 500 at that time and where he was the only African-American student. And when he was at Rutgers, he excelled in everything. He's a class valedictorian, but he's also the star athlete. And Paul Robeson has described how he was brutalized uh, at Rutgers itself, right? So, you know, when, when he starts playing sports, there was an attempt made to, to injure him. And I'm just quoting over here, that this is what he's recording years later. <clears throat> Excuse me, the white boys didn't want a Negro on their team. At the scrimmage, one boy slugged me in the face and smashed my nose. And then when I was down flat on my back, another boy got me with his knee. He managed to dislocate my right shoulder. The coach intervened at that point because he knew that Robeson was just too good and he couldn't afford to have Robeson so seriously injured that he may not be able to play again, right? Well, to cut his biography short, what's going to happen is that he's going to move into the realm of music and he becomes most renowned initially as the singer of Negro spirituals, right? So in April 19, 1925, he gives a concert at the Greenwich Village Theater featuring Negro spirituals. It's a huge hit. He is immediately in demand. He's in demand uh, everywhere, not just in the United States, but all over Europe because recordings were starting to be made. This is going to happen a bit later, but it is the newspaper reviews, right? The word is going out. And in 1927, he's going to do a tour of Paris and Europe. He's going to then live in London from 1928 to 39. And this was, of course, a case with many African-American intellectuals, artists, musicians. We know that a very substantial number of them went into exile. A good number of them went into exile to Paris. Josephine Baker makes her living in Paris. And of course, we know that some years later, James Baldwin would do that, right? Richard Wright, very significant number because I think all of them had reached the conclusion, not surprisingly, that for a black person of intelligence and talents to live in the United States was no easy task. You faced racism and discrimination at every turn. It was in fact hellish. And so Robeson is going to make his living for 10, 11 years in London from 1928 to 39. And it is in the late 1930s that he begins to get really politicized. I think a black person is always politicized right from the outset, particularly a black person of that generation, of that generation. You know, when, when Robeson, when Paul is attacked on the football field by white boys, he knew what was coming to him, to him, and he knew what, was, what this meant. He knew that he was not wanted, right? So racism was, of course, the one unimpeachable fact of life 
that every black person had to confront. I suspect that that is a case down to the present day. But here the relevance of my observation is simply this, that I think is politicization that, you know, this Jordan Goodman says that politicization began in the 30s. I suspect that it began much earlier. It's just that it becomes a lot more vocal. And of course, we have to recognize uh, here, I cannot go into the whole history of Negro spirituals, but we have to recognize that the Negro spirituals arose out of the whole era of slavery. And for those of you who are not aware of the history of Negro spirituals, the one thing that you really must know about Negro spirituals is that on the plantation, the Negro was always commanded to sink. He was told, sink. And he was told to sink because this was one way in which the plantation owner and the overseers could mark his presence. Could mark his presence. It was a way of indicating to the overseer. Well, this is where I am on the plantation. I'm singing, I'm here. I'm present for duty, sir, right? And the Negro spiritual arose out of this experience of slavery. So if, the, so if Paul Robeson had mastered the Negro spiritual already by the mid 1920s, mid to late 1920s, we can understand that his politicization began much earlier than the late 1930s. And Paul Robeson says, at that time, the artist must take sides. He must elect to fight for freedom or for slavery. I have made my choice. I have no alternative. This was in the context of the Spanish Civil War, where like many writers and artists on the left, he supported the Republicans against, of course, Franco and the fascists, right? So, um, one thing that is distinctive about Paul Robeson, and we need to bring it up at the moment, right at this, at this moment over here, and that is that Robeson became absolutely entranced by the transformation that the Soviet Union was undertaking. And if I myself had to think of a criticism of Paul Robeson, it would have to be this, not that he was a communist supporter, although it must also be said, that he was never a member of the Communist Party, right? To the best of our knowledge, to the best of the knowledge of those scholars who have really looked at the records very carefully, he was a staunch supporter, but he was not a card-carrying member of the party, right? But he did become absolutely enthralled and entranced by what transformations were taking place the kind of industrialization, lifting people out of poverty that were taking place in the Soviet Union. And one consequence of this undoubtedly is the fact that he overlooked the atrocities that were going to take place in the Soviet Union, right? Beginning in the 1920s. I mean, some might say going back to the time of the Bolshevik Revolution itself, but we won't enter into that you know, history. But certainly by the 1920s, Atro atrocities are beginning to take place. And, and these atrocities included, of course, such things as you know, deliberately using hunger and starvation as a weapon. Uh, the famines in the Ukraine have to be considered in that context as well. Right? And, and whether, whether Robeson was unaware, which it seems to me is impossible, is inconceivable, uh, or whether he actually overlooked these because he saw that the Soviet Union was, as he viewed it, the great supporter of liberation movements and the, and the global South, right? And that is going to be one of the reasons why he's going to actually support the Soviet Union. He actually placed his son, Paul Jr., in a school in Moscow, right? So his son actually went to a school um, in the Soviet Union. Now, it is unnecessary to go through all the details of what happens. There are a few critical points that we must pause over. And one is 
a meeting that takes place in Paris on April 20, 1949, right? So this is a, uh, uh, a, uh, a conference that takes place in Paris, uh, the World Congress of Partisans of Peace. Uh, it was supported by the Soviet Union, but there were a great many intellectuals who attended that as well, and artists and people like Picasso and many others. Um, <coughs> and Paul Robeson uh, attended this conference and apparently said something which provoked a fury. And this is the beginning of his political problems in the United States, right? So what is it that Paul Robeson said over there um, this is reported quite differently by different newspapers. So this is one of, one of the complications and, and, and Jordan Goodman in his book, and once again, I remind you of the title, Paul Robeson, a watched man, right? Someone who is under surveillance. What he says, he discusses this on pages 48 to 50. Um, and what he's essentially saying is that black people are not going to fight the wars of the United States, right? This is the gist of what he says. Um, and the way it was reported in the United States was that Paul Robeson is essentially saying to black people, I want you to betray your own country because your country doesn't treat you right and therefore you shouldn't treat it right, right? So of course he's going to be, he's going to be labeled a traitor uh, and all of that. And, um, you know, he's asked by a reporter uh, and this is what he says, when you talk about Negroes, you mostly think about the 14 million in the United States, but you're apt to forget the 40 million colored people in the West Indies and Latin America and the 150, million in Africa. When asked whether in Paris he had said that the Negroes would never fight the Soviet Union, so what he had also said there was that Black people, Negroes, should not be called upon to fight the Soviet Union, right? Robeson reminded the reporter when he was asked whether he had said that the Negroes would never fight the Soviet Union, I was referring to all the forces I mentioned here, right? And he emphasizes that his speech in Paris is on the struggle for peace, not about anyone going to war against anybody. So there is an enormous fallout in the United States from this speech. He is going to be, of course, immediately described as a traitor and as a communist, as a friend of the Soviet Union. He's going to be repudiated by Walter White, who is a secretary of the NAACP. That's a national association for the advancement of colored peoples. Um, although when White uh, repudiated um, Paul Robeson, uh, he also had the sagacity at that point uh, to point out, just let me quote here, it would be wise to abstain from denunciation of the Paul Robesons for extremist statements until it removes the causes of the lack of faith in the American system of government, right? Until it mean, meaning the United States government, until the United States cleanses itself of its own racial sins, it will not have the right to criticize without hypocrisy such statements as those of Mr. Robeson. Um, White would subsequently go on to take a much harsher stance against Rosen. Um, and I think what was particularly painful for Americans, white Americans certainly, but some black Americans too, was a fact as they saw it that Paul Robeson was actually initiating a critique of the United States abroad, overseas. So there's some sense of this, that this is, a, this is a domestic matter. And this is a very interesting subject in itself, which is the attempts of African-American intellectuals and activists to try to internationalize the plight of African-Americans. I mean, it's very significant that when you look at histories of 
anti-colonial movements, the history of African-Americans is not included in that. And then similarly, when you read histories of the civil rights movement of the United States, many of these histories do not make reference to the anti-colonial movements in the global South, many of which were contemporary. Of course, some countries had been freed, had become free before the civil rights movement, countries such as India, which acquired its independence in 1947, um, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, 1949-50, right? But many countries, uh, remember the civil rights movement begins, you know, if we had to pick the iconic movement, you could, you could think of the Montgomery bus boycott of 1956. You could think of Emmett Till's killing just, you know, in 1955. But 1956 is the conventional moment um, with which most histories began, the Montgomery bus boycott, and, and essentially most of these histories end in 1968. And that, that period was the heyday of the decolonization of the global south. That is when most African countries were acquiring their independence. Right? And one of the things that Robeson sought to do his whole life was to look at the plight of the American Negro, the Black American, in the context of what was happening around the world. And he and Malcolm X were among those who sought to internationalize the struggle, not with much success or any success for that matter, right? And one of the things that this book does detail is some of these attempts made by Robeson and many others, for example, there was a group of people, including Robeson, who actually even released a 200-page book, um, which was called uh, We Charge the United States with Genocide. And they sought to bring this matter before the United Nations, saying that there is a genocide being committed against African Americans in the United States. And if the United States is, if the, if the United Nations is taking up the cause of, you know, uh, black people in South Africa, which it was. Uh, the United Nations, in fact, even used to issue weekly bulletins almost on the anti-apartheid movement, right? And the United Nations was taking up the cause of countries in the global South that were attempting to decolonize. So the submission that Robeson and others had was, why isn't the plight of the black man in America before the United Nations. And that really was a powerful argument. So this book details much of that. It also details the ways in which African Americans let ropes and down very badly. This is undoubtedly one of the most unpleasant aspects of this history. Namely, that Robeson did not receive the support of African-American elites. They did not partly, as I've said, for the reason that many of the African-American elites themselves took the view that this is a domestic matter, number one. Number two, the vast majority of African-Americans were staunchly anti-communist. In that sense, of course, they were Americans, right? They may not have had the rights of Americans, but in their sensibility and in the way, and, and, in, and keeping in mind, you know, their upbringing, their schooling, their education, the fact that the vast overwhelming majority of them had virtually no roots of any kind, not even remotely in Africa. And then most of them actually had no linkages with black people elsewhere in the Caribbean and Brazil. Keeping in mind all of that, it is not surprising that African Americans on the whole were staunchly anti-communist as well. Right? And then when we move into the 60s, the African American leadership is very clear that we have to be focused on the civil rights movement, right? Let's not worry about the war in Vietnam. And of course, this was precisely what Martin Luther King's intervention was going to be, which was to say that, well, when you have oppression at home, it's not surprising that the same government that is unleashing oppression upon us back here in the US is also going to unleash oppression against people overseas, right? 
And Martin Luther King was among those black leaders who attempted this linkage. But Robeson was trying, attempting this linkage in his own fashion much earlier. The reason why he was, of course, unsuccessful is because he actually adopted a staunchly pro communist position. He was a great advocate of unions, right? And this book is largely focused really on what you might describe as the political rope sum. Um, of course, it fully recognizes the fact that that there, that Paul Robeson was a man who, who enthralled the entire world with this singing, right? Uh, Old Man River was the song that he sang and it became an enormous hit, but then, you know, he sang Negro spirituals, he sang freedom songs, and he sang, as I said, in dozens of languages, right? And some of the videos that are available on Google show him singing bit, you know, uh, to Scottish miners, to Welsh miners. When Robeson in the 1940s plays in London, sings in London, he stipulated that the ticket prices had to be set at rock bottom so that this music could be enjoyed by common people, right? But this is not what the book is only about. And I wanna just take a few minutes to talk about the greatest bulk of the book. It really needs only a few minutes because it's a very detailed discussion of Robin Robeson's forcible confinement in the United States. He was asked to surrender his passport. He refused to do so. His passport was canceled on 1st August 1950. And for nearly 10 years after that, Paul Robeson was unable to leave the United States. He was able to go eventually to Canada, uh, although one of his early attempts in the 1950s to go to Canada was stalled as well. And so in fact, what happened quite memorably, really memorably, and this is before the age of Zoom, but that's what he was doing. Essentially what I'm doing now, he sang to 2000 people in Vancouver over a telephone line, over a telephone line. And then, you know, in the background, you can hear this, the audience just going wild with his singing. And he gets a standing ovation that goes on for minutes and minutes, right? So th that, th 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 that's what happened in the early 1950s, but then eventually around 1956, 57, he's going to be able to go to, to Canada. It's a very long story. There are gonna be a number of court cases um, and, you know, Robeson's attempts, he is assisted by attorneys to, to be able to depart the United States are going to fail. Uh, the book gives details of how eventually he is going to, eventually he's going to triumph because the United States Supreme Court um, is going to um, um, uh, overturn uh, in a court, in a very famous court case, uh, a court case having to do not just with Robeson, but with several other people as well. Um, although Robeson, as far as we know, is the only person who is denied from leaving the United States for such a lengthy period of time, uh, is going to overturn uh, the government's ability to actually, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, suspend, uh, cancel a passport and prohibit a person from leaving the United States. Um, unless they are charged with a specific offense and have been convicted, obviously, right? which is a different story. But that was never the case with Robeson. Uh, 
He was never convicted. There was no crime. At the most memorable moment, I think, the most memorable moment, I think, of this is when he is called before the notorious House Un-American Activities Committee, right? H-U-A-C. This committee is well known because this is the committee that is associated with the name of Joseph McCarthy as a committee that, that went on a witch hunt against communists in this country and essentially tried to wipe out every trace of communism in the United States, tried to ensure that anyone who was, you know, even remotely tainted as they thought, particularly in, in universities, in, the, in Hollywood, in the art world, anyone who was even remotely tainted with communism would no longer be able to make a living in this country, right? They would be blacklisted. So he is hauled before, Robeson is hauled before the House Un-American Activities Committee. And I just wanna read out, he has portions of this in his book as well. Um, the testimony before this committee on June 12th, 1956. And this is what Robeson says. Could I say that the reason that I'm here today, you know, from the mouth of the State Department itself is, I should not be allowed to travel because I have struggled for years for the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa. For many years, I have so labored and I can say modestly that my name is very much honored all over Africa and my struggles for their independence. That is a kind of independence like Sukarno got in Indonesia. Unless we are double talking, then these efforts in the interest of Africa would be in the same context. The reason, the other reason that I am here today, again from the State Department and from the court record of the Court of Appeals is that when I am abroad, I speak out against the injustices against the Negro people of this land. I sent a message to the Bandung Conference and so forth. The Bandung Conference was held in 1955. It was a conference of Afro-Asian solidarity, a momentous occasion in 20th century history. That is why I'm here. This is the basis. And, and I'm not being tried for whether I'm communist. I'm being tried for fighting the rights of my people who are still second class citizens in this United States of America. My mother was born in your state, Mr. Walter. This is one of the congressmen who's interrogating him. And my mother was a Quaker. And my ancestors in the time of Washington baked bread for George Washington's troops when they crossed the Delaware. And my own father was a slave. I stand here struggling for the rights of my people to be full citizens of the, in this country and they are not. They are not in Mississippi, and they are not in Montgomery, Alabama, and they are not in Washington. They are nowhere, and that is why I'm here today. You want to shut up every Negro who has the courage to stand up and fight for the rights of his people, for the rights of workers, and I am, have been on many a picket line for the steel workers too, and that is why I'm here today. And then he continues in this vein. In Russia, I felt for the first time like a full human being. So Robeson sang in Russia often. And there are recordings released in Russia, in Russia of Robeson singing. No color prejudice like in Mississippi, no color prejudice like in Washington. It was the first time I felt like a human being where I did not feel the pressure of color as I feel it in this committee today. And then a Congressman, Mr. Scherer says, why do you not stay in Russia? And look at his answer, Robeson's answer, majestic, simple and yet majestic because my father was a slave <coughs> and my people died to build this country and I'm going to stay here. 
and I have a part of it just like you. And no fascist minded people will drive me from it. Is that clear? I'm for peace with the Soviet Union and I'm for peace with China and I'm not for peace or friendship with the fascist Franco and I'm not for peace with fascist Nazi Germans. I'm for peace with decent people. Mr. Scherer, you are here because you're promoting the communist cause. I'm here because I'm opposing, Robeson says, the new fascist cause which I see arising in these committees. You are like the Alien and Sedition Act and Jefferson could be sitting here and Frederick Douglass could be sitting here and Eugene Debs could be sitting here, right? He's saying all of these people, I, I can't get into the details of all who of them are. The chairman, now what prejudice are you talking about? There was no prejudice against you. Why did you not send your son to Rutgers? I hear that he's living in Moscow, that he went to school in Moscow. Robeson says, just a moment. This is something that I challenge very deeply and very sincerely that the successes of a few Negroes, including myself or Jackie Robinson can make up. And here is a study from Columbia University for $700 a year for thousands of Negro families in the South. My father was a slave and I have cousins who are sharecroppers and I do not see my success in terms of myself. That is the reason my own success has not meant what it should mean. I have sacrificed literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for what I believe in. And then Robeson says to him, you are the non-patriots. You are the un-Americans. <coughs> and you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. And Robeson tells the committee that I'm not going to hear from you people whose ancestors were slave owners. And you who had the same mentality, I'm not going to hear you lecture me about who is a patriot. I'm not going to stand for this nonsense. It is really one of the most remarkable things we have ever seen in the United States Congress, right? So this was Paul Robeson, a gigantic man, a majestic figure, someone who adamantly, insistently, consistently, rigorously fought for the freedom of colored peoples around the world and for the freedom of white people because Robeson understood something that no one on that committee understood, that freedom is indivisible that when, they, when someone is not free, then you are not free yourself. I hope you will take a look at this book and more importantly, take a look at Robeson's own writings and other writings about him. <clears throat>